Alright, so I said I was going to attempt to do a quick console tier list than my last one, so that's what I'm going to do now. I've already more or less gone over my history playing these things, which I've been doing since I was technically five, but older than that if you count, like, as I said, playing stuff in a pizza parlor on the arcade. Anyways, I've never really had much experience with these really old systems. I've played a few games in compilations and such, but I've never touched an old Atari. So I'm just going to put those in the never played section. Now Game & Watch, I actually have played like th one physically. It was not particularly good experience. It felt a lot like those old Tiger Electronics games, and for those that know, know what I'm talking about. As for the rest of the games on those available on those things, I've played the compilations. None of them are particularly good. Like, they're very, very, very basic score attacks, much like Tiger Electronics, when you're doing one thing over and over and over. Which, back then, yeah, that was the norm. I get it. But they don't hold up today. There's no reason to play them at all. Now, for the at for the first real console, quote-unquote, <laughs> and by that I mean the first console that it didn't be a console, not an arcade experience. The NES was quite a step forward, as it also pulled us out of said video game crisis. Or video game crash. Now, I have a bit of mixed feelings of this one. I didn't really grow up with it, though it was a part of my childhood. But my child experiences were very limited. Having played through a good chunk of its library throughout the years, the problem is, is like over half, if not two thirds or three fourths, of the NES library just sucks. A lot of them are those old arcade style score attack games where you know you play the game for ten minutes, you've seen everything it has to offer. But on the other hand, there are some genre-defining games like Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, and games that pushed that took those formulas and pushed them even more so, like Mega Man and, I guess, Contra. But for every one of those, you had, like, ten LJN games. And... Back then, they didn't know how to balance things. They were brutal. A lot of them were brutally difficult to flat up being flat on unfair. Which I don't mind a challenge, but there's a difference between a genuine challenge and just being cheap. Which again, there weren't any standards, so I I don't blame them for not knowing how to make a genuine challenge back then. But. On the other hand, it doesn't excuse the fact that a lot of those games, as I said before, were crap. Uh, I just gotta can't put that as a mid system. It just doesn't hold up today, and apart from those banger classics and genre definers, there's so much of its library is not worth going back to, and not worth playing on the original hardware either. Especially with how fail-prone they were. Now, as for Sega, I never played their SG... I think it was the SG-1000. Very basic system, and I've... I've literally never seen anything about it, so... I can't comment on that one. The Master System, however, I can comment on them. Now, I will say my experience with it is very minimal. Apart from a few games, which I don't even remember what they were, I played Black when I was like f 4 or 5. The only games that are really memorable are the Sonic games and Wonder Boy. And this, the Sonic games, half of them are just like rehashes of the Genesis games. Or backports of the Game Gear ones. Now, I get that for most people, nobody get, cares about this damn thing. But... <laughs> I still gotta... I know there's a market for it in South America. It was huge there, which those people would probably put this son of a bitch in A. But for everyone else, it's lack of games and 
for being even for being just an inferior NES, just, there's no reason to play most of them, let alone own the damn system. Now for our foray into the 8-bit handhelds. Game Boy, I see it as a bit of like the NES. It was the first true handheld experience. However, much like with the NES, there are some bangers like the Zelda games. Uh, Mario Land was pretty decent. The Pokemon games for... I won't say genre-defying because they weren't the first monster-capturing games available. However, they f I believe they were the first ones available to the U.S. So for many of them... That was that was a brand new thing. And it kind of was either way. But, you know, once again, I have to point out that apart from those notable bangers, a lot of it's library, which is bad. Short or ex repetitive experiences. I gotta put this in C with the NES. And the Game Boy Color... I've heard arguments both ways whether this should count as its own console or not since it was kind of a, just an upgrade, but on the other hand, there, it did have a slew of exclusives for a couple years, unlike the, say, in 3DS, which only had a couple. So, C tier for that as well, but it's definitely a step above the basic model. Now, we leave the 8-bit and go for the 16-bit. And for me, this was the golden era of 2D games. And this is when gaming, console gaming, really came into the limelight and shown. Now, I've already made my cases for which of the two Sega versus Nintendo consoles are my favorite, but that does not mean I rate, would rate the SNES lower. Well, I would rate it lower, but I wouldn't rate it low. I was, as I said before, in the other video, it had a more diverse library than Genesis, but Apart from some of those unique exclusives, like some of the Mode 7 games and the JRPGs, it didn't quite hold up to the Genesis for its main feature, which were, you know, platformers and such. And most of the multi-plat games were better on the Genesis. Techno technologically, you, you can make an argument either way. The SNES could do more with this Mode 7 and have... a bigger variety of sound effects in its sound chip, but the sound chip just sounded so much more muddier than the Genesis. That's not to say there weren't some good tunes on it, but I don't know, I guess I prefer that more metal-y approach of the Genesis. And plus, a lot of the Genesis games looked a bit more, I guess, brighter, if that makes sense. And they were less likely to suffer from slowdown, oddly enough, that blast processing. I don't know if that was really a thing or not, but... Yeah, I've already made my verdict on that. I would put the S and the S into an A and the Genesis into an S. Because that was the cream of the crop of the 2D. Both systems were quite good for that age, but... The Genesis just shone more to me. Unfortunately, it didn't do so well with its attachments. The CD it was an interesting idea upgrade the system to be able to play CD games, which give you CD quality music, FMVs, more power. But it wasn't utilized to its full potential. A lot of them were just like the FMV craze games, which most of them sucked. There were a few good ones, but most of them just were not. I did give a Sonic CD, which to be f one could argue did it really need to be a Sega CD game, apart from those FMVs and the soundtrack. It wasn't really a huge step up from regular Genesis Sonic. But, I don't know. It did have at least try to have a library, so... I would say, like, a bottom of C for that thing. Now, the 32X, on the other hand, yeah, we have a problem here. There were only, like, 20 or 30 games for it. It flopped hard, and... The only ones that are worth a damn, at least to me, uh, there are some games I still need to try, but the ones I've played, only Knuckles Chaotix and Sonic, or Sonic, Star, uh, Star Wars Arcade are actually good. 
So as much as I do like those two games, it still goes in O&F tier. And yes, I did own that thing physically. <sighs> now to the Game Gear, which is my unfortunate choice of handheld. It was better looking and more powerful than the Game Boy, but it had a, the severe issue of having the worst battery eating reputation I've ever freaking seen. And not only that, its library was not good. It was worse than the Game Boys, by far. There are very few games on that worth playing, and some of them are honestly better off with their back ports than the Master Systems, like the Sega, uh, the Sonic games, because they give you more screen space. So, in the D, it wasn't the worst. It wasn't the worst thing ever, but it was. T it was not good. It wasn't a terrible attempt. But that battery life combined with its library just hurt it really badly. And I don't think I really need to say too much on the Virtual Boy. If they had given it a proper head strap instead of that neck breaking stand, gave it proper multiplayer capability, and actually supported it with games, it might have been at least an okay first venture into VR, especially if it had a proper color palette instead of that blinding red and black. I've only, I've never owned it, but I have played in a demo station, and yeah, there's only two, once again, there's only like two games worth playing, Wireland and Jack Brothers. I have heard that Japanese horror game is decent, but I have yet to try it, but even with the, Jap the few Japanese exclusives it had, it barely had over 10, so F it goes. And honestly, I'm not even sure if it's fair, fair putting it there, so bottom of F. Uh, and then we had the unfortunate casualty that was the Saturn. Boy, if they hadn't have fucked up the launch so bad and overpriced it, it might have been at least okay. And the other big problem was, as I said before in the other video, over half its library didn't even leave Japan. And those games that stayed were, a lot of them were the good ones. And it never got that killer app that anyone wanted, including a proper Sonic game, because... Sonic R was mid as hell. Jam was just a glorified museum with the ports of the Genesis games, and um, 3D Blast was just, depending on how you look at it, either an enhanced or a weirder port of 3D Blast, which is better off played on the Genesis. The D tier. I just, it, it's really sad what happened to that thing. It could have been so much more. And on to the PlayStation. Mm, Sony qu uh, hit the ground running with that one. I still maintain that if somebody put the gun to my head, I would probably pick the N64 over the PS1. Because, yes, the PS1 had more games, and I honestly had more games for it. There were a lot of mid-as-hell games, and it didn't have as many genre-defining moments as the 64 did. Like, really... The only thing I can even think of in that regard is um, the first foray into 3D JRPGs through Final Fantasy, and I guess Resident Evil for survival horror. But either way, there's much like with the 16-bit. Uh, they were both great systems in their own ways. And the fact that, again, I really only pick would pick one by putting a gun to my head shows the fact that, really, they were both competent. Now, I will say the N64's games have not aged well because of their style and the controller. That's one thing the PS1 does have over the 64 quite heavily, because I can go back to those PS1 games and not get as much whiplash uh, uh, when playing them as compared to the 64 outside of a few games that are kind of timeless like Mario now where I would put them I would put definitely put the PS in A and the 64 is just slightly above it in A as well now the streamcast oof, ooh. boy oh boy do we have a problem here much like the Saturn it had it had ambition, but was executed terribly. 
I don't know how many game that what the game to game, the ratio of games coming out from Japan versus not coming out. But as I said in the other video, so many of them were just ports of PS games or enhanced ports of PS and N64 games or uh, reduced ports of PC games. Not a whole lot of exclusives, and a good chunk of them were ported to other systems when the damn thing was discontinued. It is an unfortunate casualty. It had quite a lot of personality going for it. Didn't help that it only had one thumbstick. The VMU was kind of an interesting attempt at having a gimmick that unfortunately just ended up being a gimmick. I'm going to say this goes in C as well. I would like to put it higher, but I just can't. Definitely better than the CD, but inferior to the Game Boys. The GBA. Ooh, this is a quite little uh, lovely thing. It had backwards compatibility, with the, full backwards compatibility with the Game Boy. And it had, despite its short lifespan, it had quite a library of its own. With Many of them were bangers. And the good to bad game ratio is honestly probably the, one of the best of, Ninten of all of Nintendo handhelds. Like, it had some bad games, don't get me wrong, but with how many good games it had, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to think of them. Uh, at least ones that weren't dumbed down ports of other games, like the Medal of Honor uh, game. So, high B for that one. I'm honestly tempted to put it in A. You know, I'm going to put it in the low A. Now the PS2, e. let's be fair, the main reason this was a banger is because of its games. It was weaker than its competitors, it didn't have much in terms of features, although it's, yeah it had more than the GameCube. You had to buy a separate adapter to play online. And you had to also buy this, a, that HDD for the few games that supported it. But, you can't deny it had one of the best libraries in gaming, or at least one of the biggest ones. It definitely won the JRPG uh, award, because not only did it get all the JRPGs, they were most of them were exclusive to the damn thing. GameCube did get a few, but not a lot. So, this one definitely goes the, in the A. I don't... I would put it into S for its library, but I can't for just the fact that it kind of cheated to win. So, I'm going to say top of A. Now, the cube was another nice little system. Also, another unfortunate casualty. As much as I love this thing, I, I would love to put, the, put it in A, but... Being objective, it's definitely a top B. Had a great library, but it missed on quite a bit, lot of quite a bit of multiplats. And some of its exclusives were a bit misunderstood. Like not everybody looks at Sunshine as the as the Mario game when they think about exclusive 3D Mario games or exclusive Mario games. But for what it had, it was great and had one of the uh, best standard control. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't really standard, but like the best non-gimmicky controller you can find. It was comfortable, it was responsive, it was durable. The system was also pretty damn durable and, and pretty light made it easy to transport. So, I would love to put that thing in A, but top B it goes. Now, the Xbox original was a good try. It was easily the most powerful, and it had the most robust online fe uh, features, and honestly set the stage for online console gaming. That controller was, depending on how your hands were hit or miss. I kind of liked it, since I liked its grip, but it definitely had its issues. Library-wise, it was the weakest, especially in the exclusive department. But for, as far as multiplats go, if there, it did get the multiplats, at least for Western games, that was the place to get them. So, bottom of B, it will, it will not remain where it's currently at in the B, but it's still, I guess, a B ranker nonetheless. Though I hate the fact that it made you, it started the trend of paying for online. And with the Xbox especially, it was literally paying to use your own freaking internet. 
Now the DS, the DS was had quite a lot of good games as well. However, it's good to bad ratio wasn't as good as the GBA. And while I actually I do like having two screens for a lot of games since you can use the top one screen for gameplay and the other for inventory management or maps, that was very handy. And it's a shame that the uh, Switch can't do that, although for obvious reasons. But, an, an issue is, it did give way to a lot of shovelware for its gimmick. And yes, the, I know the Wii had that problem too, but I'll get to that one in a minute. My issue is the touch controls aren't as responsive as they could be sometimes. Yes, I, again, I know the Wii had that problem as well. But the problem with the Wii is I wasn't scratching my screen or getting thumb sprints all over it, just trying to make freaking Link swing his sword. Now, when it was done properly, it wasn't too big of an issue. I make jokes about Link swinging his sword, but it wasn't unmanageable in Fire Glass or Spirit Tracks. But there were some games that just did not work well, like games where you'd have to use the buttons and the styles at the same time made for some very uncomfortable situations. Which, thankfully, the 3DS did back up a bit, though it wasn't immune to that. Had a lot of great games. Was notably weaker than the PSP, and style-wise, it hasn't aged well as, say, the GBA. So, I'm gonna say B, right between the GameCube and the Xbox. The PSP... Library was not as good. More powerful... Technically, it was better looking, but it did have some artistically ugly games to it. Like, they were just look very muddled, muddied down PS2 games in some cases, and that's not a good look. And unfortunately, it only had one thumbstick, and that one thumbstick wasn't even a good one. So, you know, playing some action games could be rather problematic. Some of them did attempt to adjust for that by having automatic cameras, or in the case of, say... The Medal of Honor game, using the thumbstick to move and the face buttons to aim or being able to flip them. Uh, that UMD drive was not a good idea as well, because it made some for some pretty bad load times and it was a format that was never used again, so backwards compatibility, you can forget about that unless it was digital. So, inferior to the DS, but still probably better than the Xbox. Good try, Sony. It was a good try, but not quite up to snap or, or scruff, whatever you want to call it. Now for the Xbox 360, this one had a quite a strong start. A lot of uh, ports of PC games that people probably weren't expecting to get yet, like Quake 4, had some strong exclusives for the first few years. Then, unfortunately, they just gave up on that. And the PS3 ended up taking over later in its lifespan. Plus, it also had one of the worst fail rates I've ever seen. And the worst part is Microsoft freaking knew about it, but launched it anyway. I had two of these things die on me. One was in warranty, the other one was not. So I gave up on it after that, which is unfortunate because... Again, there are some good games on it, as far and a lot of the multiplats are actually better on the 360. But for its fail rate and for its terrible second uh, half of its year, which was almost all multiplats, and as well as like changing the UI multiple times, so you had to relearn it. I'm gonna just say that's a C tier, top C, sure, but uh, way too many issues. PS3 had the opposite problem of the 360. Very weak lineup, but a strong finish. Fail rate, the early models also had some issues, though they weren't nearly as bad. What I hate is the fail prone models were the ones that were backwards compatible with PS2 games. And I still have a grudge at Sony for removing that feature from the system. And not for cost cutting, which is what they'll make you believe. It was because they wanted to be more people buying PS3 games. And I'm just thinking, maybe you should have had a better lineup bastards so yeah I am a bit butthurt about that but I won't pull it down to the C rank for the 360 because at least it wasn't as fail prone and they didn't change the UI a whole ton although 
I guess they did remove that ability to install custom OS's, but they got sued and had to pay the dues. But, it wasn't a bad system. I must say this is better than the Xbox, but inferior to the PSP. Um, you know what? I'm going to put that as above the PSP, because I, between the amount of games I played on the PSP and when I could turn around and look up on my wall for PS3 games, it did have the better library. Although, then, the Japanese support kind of struggled with that, because the move to HD kind of kicked them in the nuts. Apart from some developers that embraced continuing to make uh, sprite or subpar HD games on low budget like Nice and uh, Compile Hearts. Yeah, they kind of struggled. The Wii, on the other hand, we all know that thing had a serious problem with hardware. It was basically just a souped up GameCube. And we all know that because of the casual market, it had probably the biggest library of shovelware ever. However, the games that were actual games tended to be good. Some of them had control issues, but most of the time it was manageable. But when the motion controls were used well, they were used well. My favorite was IR aiming. Being able to play like Call of Duty 3 or some of the other shooters that came out by using the Wiimote to aim, especially if you use the uh, zapper attachment. Not only made aiming better than thumbsticks because you didn't have to rely on auto-aiming, but it was also a, a step in the right direction for immersion. And honestly, any game that used motion controls properly was a step control in the right, right direction for immersion. And honestly, if it hadn't been for the Wii, we might not have gotten modern VR as well. It's a shame that they ended up kind of dropping that. Well, yeah, the Wii U did have motion controls as well to some degree, and the Switch has gyro. It just, it wasn't the same. They're definitely more responsive than the old Wii was, but the way they're implemented, just it, was, it just wasn't the same. Especially in the aiming, because gyro aiming is helpful, but it just doesn't hold the candle to IR aiming. But I'm going to put this in... B between the DS and the PS3. I would put it higher if it didn't have so much shovelware in its library, but it was a good little system. And the ability to play backwards compatible, have backwards compatibility with GameCube early in its life was great. It's a shame they took that out in the later models, and I never understood why. Now, for their next handheld, the 3DS. It did not have as good as a library as the DS, I will say off the bat. And it also had a botched launch being overpriced. The original models were not that great either because the screen space... Ooh. However, I, now that I have a, a new 3DS, I love that widescreen. And while it's not particularly used when playing uh, virtual console or DS games the same way, just having that extra screen space for 3DS games is lovely. And, most importantly, I don't know if it's really fair to count this uh, because it's unofficial use, but hacking it gives you the entirety of Nintendo's handheld library at your fingertips and playing them as close as they were meant to be played instead of having to screw with an emulator. The entirety of the Game Boy uh, library is easily done by an injector. Same thing with the GBA. And if you don't want to use an injector, you can use an emulator. Though, personally, I'd prefer the injector. DS had, was a bit problematic at first because the uh, bootstrap wasn't as advanced and a lot of games had issues. But most of them are ironed out by now, though I still kind of prefer using a flashcard. But either way... Just having the entirety of Nintendo's handheld at your fingertips is great. And while its library wasn't as good, and it did have some bad games later in its life, like... I don't know. I guess... The first thing that comes to mind is Custom Robo Ziplash. And a lot of people didn't like Hate Pikmin, though I thought that game was okay. The majority of it was at least good. So... B above the DS. You know what, I'm going to say it's even better than the GameCube. Just because of attackability. 
The Vita... You know what? I don't care. I'm just going to say Vita. It sounds cooler. Vita just sounds like a freaking drink. The Vita... Um, that was a down, definitely a down step. I understand why I didn't have full backwards compatibility because it didn't have the drive, but they didn't. They, only, they put less than half their library on PSN. Now, you can hack it to give full uh, compatibility with the Adrenaline Emulator. But two systems in one isn't as good as the 3DS is four in one doing that. Plus the Vita's library. Mm. You better like JRPGs and visual novels because that's mostly what it got after the first year, year or two when all the Western developers jumped ship and most of the JPs gave up on making those type of games as well. Which is a shame because some of those early games weren't bad. Like, Uncharted Golden Vist and Killzone Mercenaries are both pretty good. But, yeah. Better like better like those JRPGs. Because if you don't, this isn't probably going to be an F tier for you. It doesn't help that it was also overpriced at launch, like the 3DS. And, unlike the 3DS, you had to buy an overpriced proprietary memory card. Ugh. I'm going to say this is C... Between the Game Boy... Yeah, you know what. That's I think that's appropriate. Anyways. Next we have the Xbox One. Boy, did they fuck up the launch with that one. They tried to... They tried to make it an always online and quote-unquote morph the idea for, of ownership. And then Sony went and trolled them with how you can trade games and such, which was pretty funny. <laughs> Thankfully, they kind of turned it around, but unfortunately, they killed the backwards compatibility. I don't know why they did that. Because while they got a fair chunk of the 360 exclusives on there, most of the ex original Xbox exclusives are still unplayable on it. Uh, I'd rate this, I'd probably put this higher if it was... Uh, backwards compat had proper backwards compatibility and it, it, its library wasn't 99% multi-plats because like for exclusives you had gears halo and rare replay that's about it d tier had a good controller though gotta give it that and it does have the best online infrastructure you know what i guess if you like the online infrastructure i guess it can go to c Now, the PS4, I don't hold in much better regard than the Xbox One, to be honest. Because there's zero backwards compatibility with that, number one. Number two, they jump shit on the, oh, you gotta buy or pay for your internet thing, use your own internet crap. When all they really added to that was, was cloud saves. But, it was power fairly powerful for its time, and it wasn't too expensive. Definitely pricey, but not as bad as the PS5. Or even launch PS3 for that matter. But, yeah, it did get some exclusive Japanese support, but it's still kind of weak as far as that goes. If you're going to play like games that you can get anywhere else, this is definitely the place to go as opposed to the uh, X-Bone. But, yeah, I, th that and the fact that it's, like, moved away from all the um, benefits of having a console apart from, you know, used games by having all these day one patches. The fact that a lot of the di games aren't even on fully on the disc anymore. And just the fact that you constantly have to update it, update the system itself, you have to install the things to the hard drive, and that was a pretty shitty hard drive space too, I might add. So, at bottom of B you go. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. <laughs> um, the Wii U. Yeah, I'm gonna get flack for this one, but I'm just gonna say I don't care. It was a very underrated system. Yeah, I get it. its library was pretty weak. It did not get most of the multiplats after they gave up after the first few years. 
and Nintendo's own exclusive kind of stunk later in life because we got Nintendo Mario uh, Tennis Ultra Smash and what a POS that was. Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, huge pile of mediocrity. But when they tried, they tried and gave us some good games. And I gotta say, I do like the grip on that gamepad. And when the gamepad was used properly, it can be used pretty well. Like, even if it's just... Even if it's just using it as, a, like, a second screen and similar to a 3DS to ways to manage your inventory have a map was nice. Because that's less space to use on the screen, less time in the pause menu. And sometimes the being it was being uh, used in ways that actually made sense for on-screen usage. Some of the Mario games made pretty good use of it. Um... I don't know. I mean, I also have to weigh in the fact that, much like the 3DS, the hacking ability is great because it's fully backwards. It's already fully backwards compatible with the Wii. But by throwing Nintendo on there, which has almost perfect compatibility with GameCube games, although you can't play them physically, unfortunately, you get three systems in one. So, you know what? I'm going to put you right there above the Xbox. I wish I could put you higher, but unfortunately your library did not hold up, and you died a slow death. You were overpriced at launch, and your advertising was mismanaged. I love the little thing, but that's as high as I can go. Switch, on the other hand... Hmm. We got a situation here. I... I don't know. The hybrid idea was excellent. It brought the gaming mar the console gaming market back to Japan who were moving to phones and handhelds only. It gave us a lot of great experiences here, although some of the more... They've had some issues with the, some of the more recent games. The Princess Peach game was kind of meh. You know, the Pokemon games are... The main games were also kind of mad, but some of the spin-offs were decent. Like, a lot of people like Arceus. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, the sports games were hit or miss. But they have given us a huge library, and a very diverse library at that. Um, NSO was definitely mismanaged, though it's 20 bucks for the base version. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Expansion is a bit of a harder sell, especially since I really think they should have added more game DLC to that to make it worth it. The, the thing is definitely underpowered, which is unfortunate, which means the few multiplats we do get, or have been getting later on, have been 30 FPS at, at best. And not even a smooth 30 FPS. However, it has been great for Japanese games. As apart from like the Westaboo ones, like Capcom and Sony... We've been getting a lot of games that are either exclusive or only uh, also available on the PS or the PS, the PC. So we, between the indies, the Japanese games, the Nintendo games, and the third-party games we do get, you got. I have probably the set. This is probably makes up my second biggest library of physical games. Only done in by older PC games. Like, I probably used to have more PS2 games, but since I sold a few of the ones I didn't care about off, and I've been collecting Switch games, yeah, I've definitely got more. So, call me a fanboy what you want, but that's the only other case I can make for S-Rank because of the sheer innovation of having that hybrid system and the fact that this is the last console that feels like a proper console instead of like a PC light. You know, it's very much a lot of the games are plug and play. I don't I don't have to go with the bullshit of waiting for them to install forever. Though some of them do have early patches and there are some third-party games that aren't fully on the cartridge. But, you know, when I buy a Nintendo game, it's done usually. And if there is a patch, it's usually not a huge one apart from Games that have been getting a lot of post-launch content, like Splatoon.
Uh, as for the PS5 and the X and the Series X, I don't own any any of these, but I have gotten to have a little experience with them. Series X is just a souped-up Xbox uh, One. The developer mode does give it some interesting uh, usage with emulators, but apart from that, in the fact that these have even less exclusives than the Xbox One does, yeah, I'm just gonna put it at basically in the same place. I'll let, yeah, you know, I don't think it's fair to put either of them below the the Sega CD now that I'm looking at. Eh, hey, hey, quit it. There we go. As for the PS5, it's definitely better than the uh, Series X, but I appreciate the fact that it has backwards compatibility for the PS4. And those haptic feedback controllers are kind of interesting when used properly. But it's big, it's bulky, it's overpriced, it was hard to get. The internal storage sucks. And while it does have more exclusives than... It used to have more exclusives than the um, Xbox. Most of them have dribbled away, either by porting them to the PC or other systems. And a lot of the ones that have been getting it has not been to, have not been particularly good. And the ones that are good have been ported off the PC. And it doesn't really help that Sony's getting a lot of backlash for their current censorship. As well as other business practices, but... It's better than the Series X. Probably... Probably better than the Dreamcast. Yeah, that looks about right, since this is the, probably the best place to go for multi-plats. But anyways, that's my feeling on consoles. Or for what we got. I'm hoping I'm hoping Sony pulls their head out of their ass and does a better job with the PS6. I think MS is just DOA at this point. And the Switch 2, I'm hoping they learn from their mistakes, they make a more powerful console. You know, they add some gimmicks that aren't gimmick gimmicks, but give you more ways to play, you know, such as improving the gyro, maybe, or maybe having some sort of VMU-like function in the controller, I don't know. But, hopefully they, that has a solid launch, it's not too overpriced, it's more powerful, it's backwards compatible, and will have something that could probably trump both it and the Genesis. But yeah, this is my tier list, out.